What's up, survivors? Jason here. Today, I'm going to continue on my series on what to do when lost in wilderness, part 6. And this one is talking about food. Alright, to start this off, I want to give you some book references that I've collected over the two years that I've started actually looking into books as the actual reference to everything. So some of the books that I currently have are the Bushcraft 101 by Dave Kenneberry. This does go over some trapping and different ways to prepare your food and all that stuff. So this book is really handy when trying to find out all that stuff. Then Tracks and Trailcraft. This one's the second edition by Ellsworth Yeager. This one I just got. This one just goes over exactly what it says right there. Tracks and Trailcraft. This goes over what their animal tracks looks like, their different habits, and how to find them and all that stuff. And that would help you find the animals to actually go trapping for. Next, Edible Wild Plants by Thomas and Peter. And they do have a Peterson's one somewhere, but it was just the eastern side of the North America. So, that means I'm on the west side, and none of the, well, maybe some, would be in this area. They might have some of the same, but this one is... A little bit better because it's a little bit spread out a little bit more, so it's better to have this instead of the one that just says the East Coast instead of the West. Then, the Essay of Survival Guide by John Lofty Wiseman. This book is really awesome. They do have a bigger edition. This is just a pocket, and as you see right here, they do have plant identification, and different food, and all that stuff, and they do go over some like the different animals and food and stuff like that, so that's a good book to look into. Then this little wilderness edible guide, the pocket bit, pocket, it goes over the different leaves, excellent little pictures to show what it looks like and what the leaves look like, and it does have a poisonous section right here, so you won't get mixed up unless it gets like ripped somehow. And you mistake it or something, kind of like what Chris McCallanus did. But always, always make sure it is the correct one because you will be in deep, deep doo doo if you don't. Yeah. So these are the books that I currently have that kind of go into the food basis of survival. So uh, let's get into this video. Now that I've searched for some good book references, I'm going to first go into the edibility test. This test is to test out any unknown plants to see if they're actually edible. So to start this test, you want to first wait 8 hours without eating anything. You can drink water in the meantime, but what this does is actually make sure that no other food is reacting while you're testing this plant. So after the 8 hours, you want to first test a contact poisoning, kind of like poison ivy has. Take the plant and rub it on a sensitive area on your skin, kind of like under your wrist. And then you want to wait 15 minutes to see if there's any reaction. If there's no reaction, go ahead and go on to the next step. The next step would be take a small portion of the piece apart and prepare it the way you want to eat it. So you could either boil it, cook it, or just eat it raw. And you want to separate them from different portions, from the roots, the leaves, the stem, the berry, the flower, whatever is on the plant. This is because different parts of the plant is edible and some could be inedible. So you want to make sure you don't mix that up and test different parts of it. So after doing that and choosing which parts you want to prepare and which parts you want to eat and actually test, you want to actually get a piece of that, a very small portion, and put it onto your lip. Get some of it, like the oils or anything like that, that it, and put it on your lip. After waiting three minutes with no reaction, you actually 
place a very small piece of it on your tongue. And then you want to wait 15 minutes. Do not swallow it. Do not chew it at all at this meantime. After the 15 minutes, you can actually go ahead and try to chew it. But do not swallow it. Not any of the spit or anything like that. But in, when you do this, you want to wait 15 minutes, another 15 minutes. And if there's no reaction, you actually swallow a very small portion of it. And then what you do is wait eight hours. And if there's any effects, you want to actually try to get it out of your system. So try to induce some vomiting or anything like that. But got to make sure you have enough water to replace all the water that you threw up. Then, if there isn't any, any reaction in eight hours, you don't want to just pig out on it because you think it's all good to eat. Some people could actually just last a very small, minimal part of a poisonous plant and then actually just die from a big portion of it. So actually just eat a quarter cup of the same plant that you did the way you paired it and then wait another eight hours. This way, make sure that no reaction is coming. It will take a long time to do this and it will be a long process, but don't skip any steps because it's your life on the line. So one thing you have to keep in mind is actually to prepare the food before you get hungry. Because when you are very hungry, you get really exhausted and you don't have enough time or patience to actually try to do any of the long tasks that I've just mentioned about. But instead of just testing all this stuff, what I recommend is actually going for easy food, easy to identify or just actually easy to actually gra gather or just eat. Now there are some easy foods that you can go for while lost in the wilderness. The first thing I'm going to be talking about are wild edibles. The first category of wild edibles is going to be fruit. There are some pretty well known fruits that people know already but some of them just don't really know what to look for especially in the leaves. The first two I'm going to be talking about are mulberry and blackberries. They're pretty similar but the leaves and the berries are different when it comes to the actual identification. So the mulberry leaves are actually oval with tooth edges and the leaves are alternating on the stem. The mulberries actually are oval and the berries look like there's a cluster of smaller berries on the one fruit. The berries are either going to be black, purple, red, pink, or white. So on the blackberry, the leaves are actually dark green with fuzz. The leaves are going to be three to five leaflet patterns on the stem and they are thorned with white flowers. The berries on the blackberry are going to be solid core with a black or purple. None of the other ones are going to be ripe. So you've got to look out for that stuff. And if you see a white blackberry or something like that, it might not just taste that well. <laughs> So the next thing I'm going to be talking about is the raspberry. Oh man, raspberries. These are probably my most favorite type of fruit. The raspberries, their flowers are going to be white to a white greenish color and most likely going to be found in June or July of the year. The leaflet pattern is three to five and the leaves are pointed at the tip and wide at the bottom and it's a tooth edged. The berry is red and it has a hollow core. The next thing is a blueberry. The blueberry are exactly what it sounds like. It's a blue berry. The flowers on it are white to pink and are belled flowers. The blueberries are round and have a crown on top of them. The leaves are pointed ovals and either green to green blue during the spring and summer and sometimes they are a little bit reddish during the fall. Next is the strawberry pincushion cactus fruit. The pincushion cactus is a small cactus ranging from 3 to 5 inches high and 3 inches in diameter. 
You can find them in patches, but you can actually find them just by themselves. They do have furry looking thorns, but also have some fish hooked up spikes. So don't pet it because it ain't a hedgehog. <laughs> the fruit is really accessible, but the fruit actually looks like a red chili, but it ain't hot at all. It's actually really sweet and a really nice snack to have on the trail. So it's a highly recommended thing, but you could usually find them just in the desert. That's kind of one of the things you gotta memorize because it ain't in the woods, most likely. The next thing is a cherry. We all should know what the cherry looks like. A red to cherry, black type of fruit, and it's round and has a pit in the middle. But some people don't know what the leaves look like, so here what the leaves look like. Next is a rent green. Some people just know this as like kind of a mint type of little plant, but some of them don't really know that it actually has berries. The berries are quite edible and do taste great. You can even make them into a tea. But they're usually available during the spring, fall, and winter. Hence, wintergreen. <laughs> the prickly pear cactus fruit is the next and last thing I'm going to talk about about fruits. This is really accessible and really tasty. I mean, awesome fruit. But you usually find them in the desert. The red fruit on top of the prickly pear cactus is amazing. I can't say that enough. It's a mix between watermelon and some type of kiwi. So the red fruit on top of the paddle of the cactus actually just grows in some type of red type of oval sphere almost and you remove it by taking some type of pliers because you don't not want to touch it. They have spiny type of glocks up glockets on there but what you do you just grab it with some multi tools or a handkerchief or anything like that and scrape off those glockets because if you miss one glocket and get it in your throat it will hurt a lot because you cannot get those out but once you get it all done and scraped off you can cut it in half and get to the gold inside the fruit is just awesome but you definitely need to look out for the seeds because they are rock hard. Man, try to bite down on one of those, it's just goodbye teeth. <laughs> but a highly recommended type of fruit if you're lost in the desert. The next wild edibles I'm going to be talking about are flowers. I'm just going to bring you three because these two are probably the easiest to actually remember. The first one is the dandelion. Yes, the wild weed that's in your backyard and really hard to get rid of. But guess what? They're edible. Everything from the yellow flower to the leaves and even the roots. You can make the leaves into a tea, but also you can roast the roots and grind them down into a coffee substitute. But another thing you can do with the roots is just boil them down like you would with carrots. But the best thing about them is you can pretty much find them anywhere. The next is the rose hip. The rose hip is a pre flower to the rose. The rose bush actually is full of thorns, so you definitely need to look out for that. But the rose hip is a red fleshy oval fruit with a crown at the tip. But one thing you can look out for are the seeds. On the seeds, they have really fine little hairs, fiberglass hairs. And if you get one down your throat, it will irritate a lot. So look out for those. You can spit them out while you're eating it or just cut the hip in half and scoop out the seeds and just eat the flesh. But the best thing about it is you can make really healthy tea full of vitamin C much more than actually oranges. So I bet it will sustain you for a long time with the vitamin C that you gain from it. You can make them from a tea or even eat them raw. So it's double bonus and it tastes good as well. But the last flower I'm gonna talk about are sunflowers. Yes, you may know the kernels from the seeds, but you could also eat the petals. The petals are really sweet, and I heard from Morgan Rogue that they are edible and kind of palatable. <laughs> so uh, I'll leave a link in the description down below to that video. The next category of easy wild edibles are trees. The trees do provide a lot of sustenance if you know what you're looking for. The first one I'm going to talk about is the pine tree. We all should know what the pine tree is and 
what it houses. The first thing that comes to mind when you think of a pine tree is most likely pine needles. And what you can do with pine needles, the fresh green pine needles, they can't be the dead ones, is actually make a tea out of it. And here is a little video of me making some pine needle tea. If you have any water or actually find any water while lost in the wilderness, I would actually recommend to actually make some tea out of that water. This will actually give you that much more energy and sustenance while you're drinking your water. So one of the instances is the pine needle tea. When you're making some type of tea, you do not want to put the materials into the boiling water while it's heating up because this would actually make the tea tastes really bad and you do not want to have that to happen. After getting your water to a rolling boil, take it off and then you could actually add your pine needles. You would want to let the pine needles sit in there and steep for at least 15 minutes. You can leave it in there for a little bit longer to give it a little stronger taste, but it's at least 15 minutes. Of to allow all the pine needle stuff to get into the water and actually make a healthy tea. You can drink it straight from the cup with the pine needles in it, but I'm going to go ahead and actually strain it out. So I'm just going to use the Stanley Ventures cook set lid right here, and I'm just using the holes to strain out the water and keep the pine needles inside. It's just to make sure that nothing solid just flies down the throat, you know? <laughs> But you can see it kind of changed the color of the water from the clear to the kind of murky green color. So that is how you make pine needle tea. not bad. Oh, you know what to make it better? Yeah. definitely get used to that. Definitely drinkable in a survival situation. Pine needle tea has vitamin A and can help with congestion, any type of flu or cough or anything like that. It can help with that. So it's a really nice little tea you can make. Has a does have a piney, sappy type of taste, and I mean, it's good. It might need something in it, but I could drink it. It's really good. No joke. I recommend it. Now to see if someone else wants to try it. 
The next thing that you probably most likely would think about when you think of pine tree is the pine cone. Some people don't really know, but the pine cone does actually house some type of nutrition in it, and it's called the pine nut. You will have to work to get into the pine cone to get to the nut meat, but it will give you some food if you don't have anything else. So here is a little video of me getting some pine nuts. There are different maturities that you can find a different pine cone. The first one I'm showing right here is an almost completely open pine cone. Second is a partially open pine cone. Third is a starting to open pine cone. And last is a completely closed pine cone. Now if you're lucky, you can try to shake out the almost completely open pine cones and you could probably find a little seed which is actually called a pine nut and these are actually edible. Also, the completely open pine cone will most likely have less pine nuts than they would with a partially open pine cone. The pine nuts are mainly located near the core of the pine cone. When dealing with a closed pine cone, it will be hard to try to open it up with just your bare hands or cutting it open with your knife. Putting it into a fire would actually allow it to open up because pine cones actually open up during wildfires to spread their seed. When you have the pine cone in the fire, make sure to turn it around to make sure that it doesn't burn on each side. Get an even burn to, to allow every side to actually open up. All right, what you want to do is just take out all the crispy and dead ones and then save these black and newer ones right here. These will have better meat and will be fuller than these. You don't have to throw these out. You could use them as bait or for like squirrels and stuff like that. But what you want to do, just you can just have a whole handful and just pop it in your mouth. Kind of crunchy, but in a pinch, it could be a little swallow food, and they're not that bad. They don't taste bad. It's just crunchy. <laughs> that one is a good one. So that's what you can do with pine cones. You can crush them up, actually just find the nut meat inside. The final thing on the pine tree is actually called the cambium layer. It is a tissue in between the inner bark and the actual wood of the pine tree. This can be easily peeled from the pine tree and actually eaten right from the tree. Or you could actually try to fry it up or like a potato chip or some type of jerky. But I highly recommend it to eat it with other food as a food extender. So that's the last thing on the pine tree and the next thing is the juniper tree. The juniper tree or bush can be identified by either the bark or the leaves. The bark can range from a grayish to a brownish color in either fibrous or alligator skin like texture. The green leaves are actually either thin and scale like or otherwise known as whorled. The berries can range from a blue to a greenish color and are round oval shaped. The berries can be in, in raw, but they do have a weird aftertaste and can be bitter. So what I recommend is actually put them into a tea to actually consume the berries. What I found out about the juniper berries is actually the Indians used to use them as a preparation for their stomach 
toward eating meat. So if they haven't eaten meat in a long time, they could eat these berries to prepare their stomachs for meat. The next tree is probably the most easiest tree to identify is the crabapple tree. You probably most likely have seen an apple tree before and know what the leaves look like, but if you don't know, here's what the leaves look like. They're kind of like an elongated type of oval, so you can identify by that, and they have like a dark green on the leaf. But I recommend not to eat too many of the crab apples because it will cause diarrhea if you eat too many. So uh, the most I recommend is actually eating probably 20 and that's throughout probably like three days so eating too many won't be good at all because if you get diarrhea you'll lose a lot of your water and you do not want to lose the water that's already in your system so I highly recommend don't eat too many the next tree is the oak tree the oak tree does have acorns and if you find acorns you can eat them but you have to make a process to actually make them edible they have the acorns actually contain tannic acid and that won't sit well on your stomach and actually cause a lot of stomach distress. So to get rid of the tannic acid, you actually leach the acorns through some water. So either run it through some flowing water in like a bandana, a sock, piece of cloth, anything like that and run it through water for a couple days. Make sure to swirl around and all that stuff every couple hours or anything like that and then in a couple days you can just eat them just by itself or just roast it but the, if you want a faster way I recommend to actually boil it in a couple of changes of water this will probably will remove a lot of the tannic acid and allow you to actually eat it you either roast it or you can actually grind it down into a flour and make banak or anything like that the last easy tree I'm going to talk about is the mesquite tree the mesquite tree usually is in deserty areas and can be found near water sources. So if you find a mesquite tree, you most likely try to find some other water, which you can use the water to actually prepare other food as well. So if you find a mesquite tree, especially the honey mesquite tree, the pods of the tree are actually edible. They are quite sweet and if you bite into them, they have some type of juice in them and can provide a lot of nutrition through that. But I got to recommend not to eat any of them that actually have holes or any bugs in them because they can make the pod rot and you do not want to eat rotten pods. But another thing on the mesquite tree are the flowers and the flowers are only on there when they're in season which is most likely going to be in the spring. So got to look out for this tree in the desert. There are many other type of trees that you can look out for but these are probably the most easiest ones to recognize and eat from. The next category is actually a miscellaneous or other category for wild edibles. The first one is the cattail. The cattail is probably the easiest and best survival foods that you can probably find in a survival situation. The reason is because there's something edible in each season. One thing I noticed in some wild edible videos is they say that something is edible in each season but they don't say which parts so I'm gonna tell you which parts so in the spring the roots the spike shoots the new green sprouts the new green sprouts are actually the pre little fruit before the corn dog looking thing and then finally the inner stalk which could be tasting like a cucumber or a celery in the summer it's pretty much the same thing but the roots and it has some spikes, not all the time, but some spikes, and some green sprouts and the inner spot. But the best thing about it is the pollen. The pollen could be a substitute for flour. So you could use that during the summer. Then finally, in the winter and fall, is just the roots. But the roots at winter and fall is the best time to actually harvest them and eat. So you can either boil the roots or just eat it dry by itself or you could actually try to leach out all the starch from the roots and actually make a flower from it. Next is the yucca plant. The yucca plant is kind of like a agave plant but with much longer and narrow pointed leaves. It kind of looks like a blooming onion with the leaves all pointed up but it also has a stalk in the middle with white flowers at the very top and plus you could eat those white flowers. 
those flowers I heard there are just delicious they're like a really good little fruit and really full of nutrition so you could eat them raw or actually cook them but if you catch the stalks really early enough you could boil it up or just cook it like asparagus and I bet it would taste like asparagus but if you're really late on all that stuff and find it like that you could actually make the seeds into a flower Finally, the last miscellaneous wild edible is seaweed or kelp. The first seaweed is sea lettuce. The sea lettuce is like an algae, and the algae kind of looks like a greenish, slimyish type of booger looking thing, but it is edible. But the sea lettuce is actually like a lettuce piece, but in that form. It actually sticks up and is really flat and actually just swirls around in the ocean. The next thing is bull kelp. Now bull kelp is an easy to identify plant and can get really tall so starting from the roots they're not really embedded into the ocean floor but these types of roots are called holdfast. They just anchor themselves to the ocean floor to prevent them from actually moving from the area. Now above the roots is a long stipe. I mean like long. They could get over 20 feet in length and also about 3 to 5 inches in diameter. So after the stipe is a bulb which can actually grow to around 5 to 7 inches in diameter in the thickest part. Finally on top of the bulb would be the leaves or otherwise called blades and they could be just as long as the stipe. So everything from the stipe to the leaves are actually edible and can give you some nutrition. The final wild edible I'm going to be talking about are mushrooms. And what I recommend is to actually take out a guide and go out for yourself to see what you will be dealing with when trying to memorize mushrooms. There are a ton of lookalikes. And if you just miss one perspective or one description on one mushroom, you will die. Because if you eat a poisonous mushroom, it will kill you. So do not go out by yourself thinking that you know everything about mushrooms because you won't and unless you're really professional at it you do not want to risk your life on a mushroom so now got that out of the way <laughs> what I recommend is actually get to know your poisonous mushrooms first because if you get to pick up a lot of the characteristics of poisonous mushrooms you'll get to know what not to eat if you go into the field just knowing what is edible you'll miss a lot of the characteristics and most likely get in a bad situation by picking the wrong thing because there are a lot of lookalikes so some examples of bad mushrooms to look out for are the death caps destroying angel and fly agaric so I'll leave a link description down below to a website that shows the different characteristics of poisonous mushrooms. Now there are some edible mushrooms like the sand trail or the morel but I don't really recommend trying to get at that because there are some lookalikes for the sand trail. So you just gotta look out for all that stuff and make sure you're eating the correct mushroom. You gotta be 100% sure. You can't be 99.99% .99 sure. You gotta be 100% sure. So I hope you like this first part of food because this is gonna be too much of a long video and I hate to uh, take you through all this long video and I'm gonna split the food into two parts. So this part is gonna be off the wild edibles and then the next part is going to be off animals and trapping and all that fun stuff with animals. So uh, I want to thank you all for watching. See you in the next one.